All right, Louis Simmons. How are you? I'm, I'm glad to be here. I'm glad you guys asked for me to come out and have a lot of fun. So, um, they've asked me to talk about the conjugate system. So, the conjugate system is basically a system of training where you constantly rotate exercises. It was uh, basically had a name in 1972. The Dynamo Club in the Soviet Union uh, had a, an exercise where they had they used 25 exercises to 40 for a group of highly qualified weightlifters, 70 to be exact. Um, after, this, after it was over with, one was satisfied to rest one or more exercises. Well, everyone was doing conjugate system. Bodybuilders have always gone to different gyms, but it, it at least had a name in 1972, the conjugate system. All right, and uh, the conjugate system is very important because uh, you constantly, you rotate exercises. On uh, max effort day for us, if you handle weights at 90% or above for three weeks in a row, you'll actually go backwards. <clears throat> so at West Side, every week we switch exercises. We max out every week 100% plus. And it's like the Bulgarian system, where the Bulgarians would uh, do near maximum weights every day. All right? Uh, they use no percentage. The same with us. On that day, we really don't care if we, get a new, we, we want a new record, but if we don't, we don't. And, uh, but each week we max out. So 52 weeks out of the year, we max out. That's probably why my gym's the strongest gym in the world. Because when you're not going to a meet, you've got to train with the guys that are. Yeah. So even though your level of preparedness isn't maybe what it is for a contest, you're still maxing out, and your body only knows it's maxing out. And your body will um, react to demands placed upon it. So if you train with heavy weights, you're going to become a strong person. All right? <clears throat> like, for instance, the Bulgarians during a, a yearly plan, um, and they only use six exercises, the front and the back squat, um, you know, the clean jerk and snatch, and the power clean and the power snatch. But they had model athletes. Their, their records, as they calculated, was nearly 4,000 a year because they would do six lifts, take a half hour off to another six lifts. They took the half hour off to, replace, um, um, to um, restore um, serum testosterone rate. All right, so they do six lifts, actually 12 lifts in the morning, 12 in the afternoon, 12 in the evening. So was, I had an Olympic uh, Bulgarian team doctor visit with me, and he said most people failed psychologically, not physically. They couldn't handle the pressure and that's why we rotate and we have no plan uh, every like tomorrow morning I have no idea what I'm going to be doing I get in Columbus because strength's majored in time not weight a struggle's a struggle if I have to fight you you know and you and you beat me up it's no different I had to fight her and she beat me up oh I know I got beat up twice <laughs> don't have to I don't have to know your names <laughs> um, where we use countless exercises and um, a few of the things that I use also is a three-week pendulum wave. It's Dr. Medvedev uh, started using pendulum waves, and I was informed by Dr. Roman that uh, also of Tudor Bumpa. But in 1964, he realized progressive gradual overload or Western periodization doesn't work. Well, I wish I'd known him then because I ended up breaking my back twice from 1970 to 1983. That's when I got all the books and started uh, learning the old Soviet Union methods. And I use a three-week pendulum wave. The reason I do, and the same one Alexis used, and Dr. Sif asked me how I came up with this. Because I said, well, after three weeks I got no stronger, and I didn't get any faster, and i just fall on my face. So eventually I was smart enough to, after a dozen years, to after three weeks I roll back down. Basically, um, I've talked about, you know, for us as powerlifters, it's 50 to 60% in a three-week wave. For people who don't wear gear, it's going to be 75 to 85%. If you look at Olympic weightlifters, the charts at the top lifters, 51% of their lifts were done between 75 and 85%. That's speed strength. All right. The rest of them were hardly any weights under 70%, and the other weights were above. Uh, when you do max effort, no one, Dr. Hatfield, Fred Hatfield said, no one can lift a heavy weight slow. That's where you become very, very fast when you're struggling with heavy weights. No one can lift a heavy weight slow. You can be lazy and lift light weights. So, see, we have a fast day. We don't call it a light day and a heavy day. We have a fast day. The dynamic day, which is sub-maximum weights with maximal speed. Force equals mass times acceleration. All right. Uh, one example, I'll give you a quick example. I had three guys as an experiment that used 100, 120 to 160 pound of chain and 405 for 12 doubles, 440 for 12 doubles the second week, 480 for eight double, or 10 doubles, and they all three squatted a new record 804 in a contest. So if they weren't producing that type of force, you couldn't squat 804. Does that make sense? 
I've seen studies in Olympic in the Olympic cleans, and um, <clears throat> uh, 154 pounds equals 264 pounds of force. So see, using dynamic methods, the only way you can produce that kind of force repeatedly, like in the bench, we'll do nine triples. So I'm getting I'm getting 27 maximum exertions with, with a fast rate of force development. No other way. Everyone thinks Olympic lifting is the key. It's two great lifts, but it's only two lifts. There's no reason you can't do the squats the same way, deadlifts or anything else. For football, I train NFL football players. They'll flat out tell you the deadlifts the whole key to it all. Overcoming that bar. You know, Olympic lifters always tell me about force development. I said, well, lift 600 pounds and show me your force development. I can count it right here. Zero. There I go, budget that bar. But uh, two of my power lifters, one was an 805 deadlift and one was 832. And they, they did 495 with a Tendo unit, 1.2 meters per second. That's pretty quick. That's world class what the first pull is in the world class weightlifters. Um, and again, we're back to the conscious because normally we get confused here, which is easier for me to do. All right. <clears throat> one, one method that the conjugate system works, you, it, it, like for us as powerlifters, we'll train at 50 to 60 percent off a box. And, and when we wear our gear, we'll go to the meet, and that's what it equates to. Remember, because the 804, 400, 405 to 480 is 50 to 60 percent of 800. And like if you squat 400, you would actually use half that weight, and you would accomplish the new record as well. Training is all weightlifting and powerlifting and strength training is mathematics, physics, and biomechanics. So there's with the system I have, there's no way you can overtrain. I could bring anyone in my gym. Any of these ladies in the second row, they could train right beside my 1,100-pound squatters, providing you use this percentage of your one rep max with them, and you'll get just as strong. You, you will increase just like they do. Does this make sense so far? All right. Look, yes. what percentage of max effort versus speed training are you doing? All right. Uh, a lot of people are totally confused, and because when they come to, there's some guys in here, uh, like Casey Bergner said, you know, well, he found out we're not slow. <laughs> Our guys can move some serious weights real fast. Uh, the, if, if you look at it on a monthly plan, we normally do about 80 to 100 speed, speed strength lifts on, for squatting us, it's on Friday, uh, compared to 12 max effort lifts on Monday. All right? And uh, we found out, like, if you're, you know, if you're a 500-pound deadlifter, uh, this is over 25 years of my own research, and uh, because um, it's a little bit different Olympic lift because bar, uh, power lifters are heavier, the weights are heavier, the bar moves slower. Time and attention is longer. And uh, if, if you're a 500 deadlift, you work up, you know, like 405, 495, that's 90% of 500, basically. Then they probably do 480 and 505 for a new record, you're out the door. Or 505 and one more, out the door. Uh, you, two things will happen most. You'll get hurt or you'll fail. So once you get a new record, get out. And you know, don't bite off everything at one time. If you get a new record, you say, I got 20 in, left in me, stay that way. Um, I was doing a seminar with Dr. Mel Siff in Vegas. And, you know, uh, Mel comes up two hours later, you know, just flies up and jumps in front of me. So I sit down and he starts talking. He goes, you never train minimally. And I go, well, yeah, that, that's for pussies. I, I'm all up of that. I'm, I'm sitting behind him, you know. He goes, you never train maximally. I go, well, I've done this all my life. Maybe that's why I don't have any body parts. He goes, you train optimally. And, that, and as smart as Mel was, that's the most profound thing he ever said that I grasped. Train optimally. Save a little bit of something. No, don't take your dying last breath, you know. If, if I'm a huge fight fan. You see a guy come out in the first round, throw 200 punches, he might not see the fourth round, winning or not. I watched one of the Klitschko brothers do it a couple years ago in a heavyweight fight. Um, one way, the conjugate system also, you have to constantly change volume and intensity. All right, even if you've got an 800-pound squat, how can you change intensity? By using different bars. All right. Let's say you um, let's say you front squat 500 pounds. You remember the 50 to 60 percent. All right. So what's 50 percent of 500? Can you write this down for me, please. Yeah. Too fitty, right? 250. Okay. Now, and you're a safety squat bar. You use a safety squat bar, and your your record 600. 50 percent is 300. Write that down. Write that down. Okay. And you can back squat 700. So 50% is 350. You run a three-week wave with the front squat. All right? So the first week you know, is a 250. All right? And on the fourth week, you start a second wave and use a safety squat, a safety squat bar, which your 50% is 300. 
And on and the seventh week, you roll back to a regular squat bar because now you're getting ready to go to a contest, and your 50% is 350. All right, now what does this mean? Th this is what this exactly means. And when I explained this to Tudor Bump, because Tudor told me my training was all wrong, but I, I told this to Tudor, and he says it makes 100% uh, sense to him then. Because uh, at 50%, the barbell will have the same velocity, okay? And... Um, um, and the bar, uh, and the, but the, the weight will be different. See, the volume will change, but the bar velocity will stay the same as, uh, with the percentage. In other words, your front squat 250, almost the same speed that you're going to seat the squat bar 300, and that you're going to use 350 in the regular bar. You I understand that? The bar speed is going to be the same at that uh, intensity zone, but I just change the volume by as much as 100 pounds when I actually get to the third phase. Per 200 pounds per set because we do two reps. Now, you guys follow this. Because this loading is the most important thing. Uh, Dr. Roma, Roma is, uh, what's his name, Roma? Roman, he'll tell you exactly, it's, it's, if you, without a plan, you plan to fail. Whatever you do in life, if you don't have a plan, I guarantee you, you're planning to fail. I don't care if it's to become a millionaire or a world champion or something. Okay, so you see how that works? See that? You understand it? Okay. And that's very important because why? Because here in America, and I'm not bad mouth because I love Olympic lifting, but they, they use one bar. They back squat and they front squat. They back squat and they front squat. They use the same percentages. Does anyone know what that is called? It's called accommodation. You do the same thing over and over and you become no better at it. Once you accommodate to something, whatever your name is, once you learn to spell it, you can only spell it wrong. You can't spell it any better. You can only spell it wrong. See, that's what accommodation is. So that's why you have to, Dr. Ben Tabasnik, uh, Ben told me one time, to adapt to training is never to adapt. Once you adapt, you'll never get any better at it. You just become an assembly line worker. That's what the speed barrier is. When people run, I had a fellow from Texas come up to try to make pro football, and he said, and it was funny because it was right before the Thorage Convention, National Thorage Convention, which I speak at in Columbus, Ohio, and he goes, no matter how fast I run, I just can't run any faster. And I got to thinking, why don't I talk about the speed barrier? Because that's what happens to people. They'll run so fast through just running. Like if you were, if your dad played ball, football, you probably stuck a helmet on you at six years old. All you ever done is play football. You become so accustomed to the sport itself without a general background that you can't actually, after a point, you can't run any faster. The only way you can is stop running and do other activities, which I'd be glad to talk about later. I've already talked to it about the coach back there. Uh, but that's how you will beat the speed barrier. I don't run ball players, and I take two or three tenths off an NFL prospect in two months. Every time. I don't run them one time. 